All right. Well, thank you everyone for attending the DAS summit, especially the first keynote uh, of the of the summit. Um, first talk we're going to have is uh, from Grant, Gal uh, Grant Galvin uh, from Walmart Global Tech, who's going to be talking about uh, clusters of clusters. This is the title of the talk, and that's about using DAS distributed to scale enterprise machine learning systems. Uh, Walmart's done a lot of awesome work uh, in the distributed space. Uh, DAS has been a, a pretty big key to that. So I'm going to hand it off to Grant to uh, tell us what's going on. Thank you. Awesome. Hey, hey, thanks so much for having me, guys. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, really appreciate everybody coming. Uh, so this is uh, what what what's early morning on on the east coast of, of North America. So you know we're we're kicking it off. We got three days uh, of talks and workshops and fireside chats and and uh, a lot of other cool stuff. So thanks for coming. Um, I'm here this morning to, like Jake said, um, talk a little bit about how we use DAS Distributed um, to, to scale enterprise machine learning systems or the development thereof um, at, at Walmart. And, um, it, you know, I'm, I'm going to talk about this in the, in the context of, of a couple of case studies, if you will. But, but I think a lot of the material we're going to cover is pretty broadly applicable to, to almost inter, any enterprise that, that is going to build systems that are enabled by, by machine learning models um, at, at an enterprise scale. So, um, all right, one sec, get the slides going here. So a little bit about myself. Um, I am a, a data scientist for uh, Walmart US storage systems. Uh, and I, I spent most of my time building some, some pretty large scale uh, machine learning based systems. Um, it, you know, basically anything that, that is going to enable uh, a, a software system that's running in a, a Walmart US store, uh, that, that's what our, our store system team work on. And, and so, you know, today here, we're gonna talk a little bit about, about scaling and about doing it quickly. Uh, because when it when it comes to, to large scale developments, uh, Walmart uh, is, is 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 a great example. So, you know, you know, just to give a little bit of uh, of motivation and, and, and context, um, it, you know, I, I I pulled pulled these these couple back of the envelope stats um, out of a, a recent report. Algorithm is a research firm that, that kind of keeps tabs on the on the tech industry and. You know, they release an annual report that, that discusses um, the, the, the current state year over year of, of machine learning, specifically in, in its enterprise use. Uh, it, you know, over the past decade, a lot of companies have really been going through this, this journey to, to data, data maturity, you know, where they're, they're using advanced analytics, data science, the machine learning, et cetera. But, Despite all that, even in 2020, um, the, this, this most recent poll, which I believe was just over 750 large and small enterprises, 43% you know, of, of those enterprises still cited scaling um, you know, beyond the, the laptop is, is their, their primary ML operations challenge. And, and, and the majority uh, in fact, are still having a hard time of getting machine learning models out there in production and operating them to, to solve their business problems um, quickly. Uh, most of them are, are still take more than 30 days to get a single ML model uh, out there. Now, I, I think all of us are, are probably, if you've been doing this for, for any time at all, probably pretty familiar with, with this. Is scaling machine learning is a, a difficult thing to do. So, it, you know, what I want to talk about here today are some some principles that we've we've developed uh, at Walmart and and the tools that enable us to to kind of tackle those two main issues. Uh, but but in order to to understand that and uh, you know why these these principles are important, let, let's take a look at kind of historically what the the data scientist workflow was like. Uh, it, you know, for the most part over the past decade, the, the way things work is, you know, you have some business problem you want to solve, machine learning is your solution. Um, you, you take some small data set and, and take it back to your desk and with your laptop, you build some prototype model. 
um, things are looking good. And so maybe you, you do a, do a pilot, um, and in the context of retail, we do this a lot. We'll, we'll go, uh, you know, release a system in, in one store, or 10 stores, um, something like this, just to see if we're in the, in the right ballpark. Um, and, and you, you, you get those results, you take them back to your, your leadership or your business partner, or your customer, um, whoever that may be. And they're like, okay, great. Awesome. Let's thousand exit. Um, and, and so you, you go back to your desk and, and you, you try to thousand exit doing the exact same thing you just did. And, and, and that usually doesn't work out too well. Um, so you kind of have to redo everything using totally different tools from, from what you did the, the first time, uh, relearn everything. And, and, you know, you pull that off, but before you know it, it's, it's next year. Right. And so who knows if if that that business value can even be realized uh, anymore. So so we're saying that don't don't do this. Um, so, you know, these principles that that I that I alluded to um, really uh, it it all comes down to leverage. Um, you know, so if if we want to go from the prototype to uh, large-scale production systems, and we want to do this quickly, right, on, on the orders of days or weeks instead of months or years, uh, we, we need leverage and, and different kinds of it. And, and so I, I think I can summarize this in, in, in three general principles that, that, that we use. Um, and, and the first one is, is leverage, leverage your code. That, that is, choose tools that that allow you to use the code that you developed on day one in that first prototype, um, and and then and then replicate that. Right, uh, you know, code is about the cheapest thing in the world to to duplicate as long as you're you're not making a lot of substantial changes to it. Right, so zero marginal cost for you know additional business value. Uh, the, the the second one is let's let's choose tools that allow us to scale up. Um, and, and what I mean by scaling up here are, you know, scaling up your, your physical infrastructure, right? So we're going from laptops to probably large cloud-based VMs. Um, and, and then also scaling up your data, right? If you're going to solve a real world uh, business problem, you're, you're going to need much more data um, just to, you know, make those, those systems robust uh, to, to the real world. Um, and so it's, it's important that we start thinking about how we organize our data to, to kind of match the physical infrastructure that, that we will be working on. And, and then that, the, the, the final principle is, you know, if we want to go the full nine yards, um, we're, we're going to have to scale out eventually. And so here we're talking about horizontally scaling so that we're doing parallel processing. But, but the key is if you use the right tools and, and, you know, here we're 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 here today to talk about desk that that you can still do this with with minimal code changes. So so it allows you to leverage um, everything that you did on you uh, under those first two principles um, when when you use use DAS to to solve these problems. So um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna actually walk you through a couple examples um, and and show you how we can use DASK in different ways. Uh, the, the first of which is to, to solve that, that vertical scaling problem. So we're, we're going to go to bigger machines and, and more data. Um, so we'll, we'll use Dask as, as sort of a, a, virtual, a virtualization tool um, to, to manage uh, local workloads on, on large machines. And then, and then the second and, and most obvious is, is, is building that distributed system so that you can start doing some, some parallel computing. Um, so... Uh, the, the way that I'd like to do this is, is really walk you through uh, a, a couple examples. Um, so we'll, we'll call them case studies maybe, but, but these, are, these are actually um, problems that, that we've solved relatively recently um, at Walmart um, that, that, are, that are used in stores. Um, and, and there's a, you know, a range of, of popular data science tools that, that we'll use to, to do this. So a, a little bit of preview before we we dive into the into those details. Uh, I, I think what you'll see is that in, in both of these case studies, there's there's sort of this general pattern 
that that emerges. Um, and and so if you if you start over here on the left hand code block, um, it, you know any data scientist is going to be extremely familiar um, with this with this setup, right? So you you're on your your local machine, you got a small sample data set. Um, what are the steps you're going to go through to to build some some ML model? You know, you're probably going to have some some pre-processing pipeline, uh, perhaps I could learn when you're first starting off. Um, you're going to transform a, a training and, and validation data set. You're going to build some model with your with your favorite package. And then, you know, you're calling dot fit and, and dot predict. Well, uh, going from that um, to to the to the next stage, so scaling up. Right. So we're going to go to larger data sets and, and, and larger infrastructure. Um, if you use the right tools, you can do this with, with virtually no change in your semantics and very little change in your actual code. So in that, that middle code block is an example of, of how you can um, you know, instantiate a pipeline that, that's, that's meant to manage actually multiple GPUs. You add a few transformation steps, um, you build and compile your model, and then off you go. And, and as you can see, the, the the two match up almost identically. Very very small um, lift when it comes to to changing your code and going from that laptop to to the to the large cloud based VM. And, and then finally, um, and and this I think is really the 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 beauty of of DAS distributed in its purest form is that you can take your your local code and and your your you know, your, your scaled up version of, of, of code. And you can very easy, easily generalize it to use, um, you know, low level Dask APIs to, to start doing um, almost arbitrary parallel processing um, a, a, across a number of machines um, at the same time. So, so that's the general pattern we're gonna walk through. Let's, let's dive into, into the details. So the, the first the first study the first case study I want to talk about here um, is is how we um, did some hyperparameter tuning for some some time series forecasting models that we that that we built um, uh, about a year or so ago. Um, the 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 stack that we're using here is a pretty typical Pi data um, and and one of several different model architectures. We, we took a look at Facebook Profit, uh, among others. And then we used Dask um, to, to, to scale this up. Um, so just to give you a little bit of an idea first about the, the, the scope of the problem, um, you know, we're, we're, we were forecasting business metrics um, for a, a number of Walmart US stores. So in, in the US alone, we have just uh, just about 4,600 stores, and and we're we're talking about working with really small parametric models. So in in this context, you've you've got a single model for for each store and and each business metric that, that you want to develop a forecast for. And, and how how do you how do you tune that? Uh, you know these these small parametric models are, are generally very sensitive to to your hyperparameter configuration. So you really need to do a robust search to to get a good model out of it. Well, just just looking at the sheer numbers, you know, if if you have the the order of a thousand different parameter hyperparameter combinations, and and you've got one model per per forty six hundred stores, you can see how these numbers get very very big quickly. You know, it, even though the small model on your local laptop um, only takes a few seconds to train, when you start multiplying that by millions of models. Um, obviously, you start running into into a bottleneck. So that's that's the scope. So how do we, or how did we in this particular case, you know, go follow that general pattern? You know, your local code, you scale up, you scale out. Um, and, and so the way that we did this, um, it you know, once again, this this code block is probably going to look pretty familiar. Um, you know, you got a, a data frame that you read a small sample sample data set in for, for um, a, a single store, right? You, you know, you split it up to your training validation regions, you instantiate your model, and, and then you call dot fit, and, and you're, you're off to the races, okay? So the first step here is, okay, we can do that on our laptop, no problem, uh, forecasts look decent. So I, how, do we, how do we scale that up and start leveraging our, our on-demand cloud resources? 
Um, and, and so we're gonna take a look at, at how we kind of go from this general architecture here on the left, right? So you got this single machine to the architecture here on the right, where we've got a single machine, but it's presumably a very large machine, lots of memory, lots of CPU cores. How do we virtualize that machine to really take uh, advantage uh, of all those computational resources instead of just you know sequentially looping over things? Let, can we start doing some parallel processing? And so, so that what that looks like is initially we're going to scale up and create that virtualization by utilizing the the das local cluster api and and what this does is is it just divides your your physical um, hardware into into virtual workers right so you can allocate an arbitrary number of, of cores threads or or python processes to to subsets of the cores on on a single large machine and then the the cool thing what you can do is you can take the exact same code that that it took you or that, that you used to to load your your single pandas data frame on on your laptop and you just wrap it in a python function like like we have here in the second code block um, and, and then what you'll do is um, for each individual time series you know we'll call that a site or or a store in this case um, now that you have your your local cluster which is virtualized the machine um, and and you can partition your data um, by the, the the site that the time series is associated with. Then, then with just one single line of code, you can submit this function that contains all the logic to load data for an individual site, and you can submit that to this this local cluster, and it will map um, a, a a time series to each worker. And, and what it then returns is, is a DAS future. A DAS future is, is a pointer to something that is loaded in your distributed workers. In this case, it will be a single remote time series data set. And, and so now that you have your, your data split up um, that, that as it maps to the, the different virtual workers on this single large machine, it's then pretty straightforward to take the exact same code uh, that you used on your, your local machine to, to train that profit model. You wrap that in, in a single Python function, and then you, you submit that to the cluster once again. That's the, the last line down there, where now you are taking, for each individual worker, you told it to go, go train a single profit model. And as input, it takes that, that future um, that, that you loaded on, on the previous step. And so in, in, in doing this, this, this allows us to really maximize our, our, our resource allocation um, on, on single very large VMs um, by, by using DAS basically just to, to virtualize it and, and um, train those individual models accordingly. So, so finally, the, the last thing, right, it, you know, even on the, the largest cloud VM, you're talking uh, roughly 100 cores or so, and you know, let's say you map one worker per core. Well, we we still need to go beyond that, right? So now we need to go the full nine yards. We need to do some horizontal scaling, and and, and the the cool thing that I'm showing you here is that it's it's almost trivial to to go from the local cluster that you just had there, where you can train roughly 100 models on a single chain, to to say 50 machines. Right, where you have a, a hundred models on each, and and all together you're going to have roughly five thousand models. Um, so it, this is kind of the the architecture, right? We're going to take the code on the left, um, and we're going to generalize it to to that there on on the right. Um, and and the great thing is, uh, once again, this is only a couple more lines of code. Um, and we're going to do this by this is where the cluster of clusters is 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 coming from. Um, now we're going to have actually two DAS clusters, right? There's one locally on each physical VM, and then there's one large global cluster, so to speak. So you have a, a this is a you know a kind of a traditional view of the cluster. You've got a single master node, which is a physical machine, and then you've got individual other machines that are going to be the workers for that outer client 
that you will instantiate. And, and so once you've set up that cluster, um, all you have to do then to, to train in a, a fully distributed fashion is take all of the same code that you had that would run on your local client and they wrap that in a single Python function again. And, and then you can pretty easily from there do the exact same thing. Um, we're calling a client.submit where you're just going to loop over each of the workers in your cluster. Each one of them, you're going to assign a partition of data where that partition of data will have a subset of the, the entities that you want to start building models for, right? And, and so um, you can see here, we, we just kind of keep iterating um, and, and generalizing. The great thing here is though, it is, it's only a couple lines of code to, to, to go from your laptop to the cloud VM to, to the, the full blown cluster. And, and that's, that, that's, that's leverage, right, in, in, every, in every sense of the word, because we're still using that code that, that we developed on day one. And, and this is, this is how, we, how we're able to, to scale um, and, and do it really, really quickly, right? Um, so in, in the end, it, you know, with, with, this, with this particular project, right, we had trained, you know, roughly five million models in this in this hyperparameter search, and and you know, in terms of CPU runtime, we we did this in about seventeen hours, right, compared to um, <laughs> over over a year if you did it on a single machine, uh, which you know, it actually wasn't too long ago when when people were doing that. Um, so uh, <clears throat> so yeah, it, using using Dask here. Um, really allows us to speed. And in, in terms of actually working hours, right? You know, we were able to, to put this project together um, and build these set of models and, and have an answer in, in a matter of just a few weeks. So there, there is one more thing um, that, that I do want to show you, uh, one more case study. Um, the main distinction here um, is it's not so much the, the general pattern. Uh, but, but I do want to show you some subtle differences in, in the, the data and the architecture type of the models, the, the tools you'll use, um, and, and, and show you just how easily, uh, and, or how easily DAS can generalize to almost any of those problems um, and, and how flexible it is. So this, you know, here we're going to talk a little bit about a dynamic pricing engine that, that we had built. Now, in, in this case, we're, we're dealing with the 4,600 stores again, um, but we're, we're going to start doing, uh, making predictions uh, about the demand of an item. Um, and, and, you know, your average Walmart store has roughly 100,000 items or so. And, and when, we, when we're making predictions about an, an item, we're, we're doing it at a very fine grain level. Um, so we're actually talking about store item combinations. Um, so, so really, this is a very large and sparse data science problem, um, a, a prediction problem. So you need very large um, over-parameterized neural networks to, to ensure that you have some expressivity in your model to actually capture um, all of those differences in demand across regions, stores, customers, items, et cetera. So, so what, we, what we did here in this case was we actually used Dask um, almost identically to the, the forecasting um, pattern, but we were doing it to train very large neural networks, um, which is a non-trivial task in and of itself. When you're talking about um, you know tens of millions or hundreds of millions of training data points, and and tens to hundreds of millions of parameters in in a single model, but uh, you know let, let's walk through this here just real quick just to to, to give you some some exposure and and show you how flexible um, this is. So the you know the local code version of this is um, almost identical, right? You know you're you're reading it. This is supervised learning problem, so you're reading it. In. Um, you're, you're splitting up your data, you're doing some pre-processing transformations, you're going to build and compile your, your TensorFlow model, um, and, and then call dot fit, you're, you're off to the races. So, so now what we're going to do is uh, very similarly, we're going to scale up, but instead of virtualizing uh, the CPUs on a big machine, 
we're actually going to use the local CUDA cluster rather than just the, the normal DASC local cluster to, to, to set up a, a local cluster. But in this, in this case, you've got your, your main VM being a master node and you've attached some GPUs to, to accelerate both your pre-processing and your, your training of your neural network. And that local CUDA cluster uh, treats each individual GPU as a worker in, in a DAS cluster. Okay, and and so doing this, we're we're actually going to scale up um, the the pre-processing of our data. Also, um, so we 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 go from the PyData stack over to um, a, a different API. This is actually the the NV Tabular API that that we use to do our pre-processing here. Um, so a, a slight change in code, but the semantics are identical, right? We we define the same set of pre-processing steps. Um, you know, you instantiate some data, read it in um, from from some remote cloud storage, um, uh, apply that pipeline, and then output is your your data that's ready to actually train the neural network. It, it's identical for for the 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 Pi data stack um, in, in terms of those code semantics. But you know, once you've created that CUDA cluster um, and and then define this NV tabular workflow. Um, it, the MV tabular is actually great because it handles all the client dots in the, under the hood for you um, and, and does all that orchestration. But, but we've actually seen some really big gains um, using this, uh, that is using the GPUs to do the pre-processing as opposed to just the CPU uh, on the order of about 10x um, compared to CPU processing. Um, and, and then once, once that's done running, then, then it's pretty much the exact same thing um for for training your tensorflow model um with the exception of you're, you're probably going to use some data parallelization strategy um like you see there towards the bottom to to you know make a copy of the model on each gpu and then use some sort of all reduced method to to share the the gradients and parameter updates and whatnot um but but Nonetheless, I mean, we're talking, you know, half a dozen changes in your code to go from your, your laptop with a few cores on your CPU up to a, a very large cloud-based VM with multiple, um, you know, GPUs attached. So you can really just by scaling up to that one machine, get a big lift. And, and similarly, um, you know, that's not gonna get us all the way. So we gotta go the full nine yards again. Um, and in our case here, what we ended up doing was um, we partitioned our data based on some, some internal classification systems so that a given partition would be roughly three to 400 stores. And, and so to cover um, all of our stores, uh, we needed actually about 16 different models. Um, and, and as you know, that neural networks can take quite some time to train. Um, so I, I think if we were going to do them one at a time, it would have taken two or three weeks. Um, but but using DAS, we we're able to you know scale out completely, train train all of these simultaneously, um, at using um, the same pattern, right? So we've we basically take all of our our local cluster code, we wrap it in a single Python function, we we create that that outer client. Right, that's got a master, a single master VM, and then multiple um, distributed workers. Where each one of those workers is a really big deep learning VM, so uh, a, a lot of cores, a lot of memory, and, and multiple GPUs attached to them. Um, wrap up all the code, and and then you are calling one time this this client dot submit, where you you're going out and you're telling each individual worker to go read a specific partition of data. That data is read in. Um, that, that whole Python function is executed. So it pre-processes the data and, and trains that model and then, and then returns your, your trained model for you. So, uh, it, you know, the, the main takeaway here, right, once again is, um, you know, how we scale up and how do we do this? How do we do this quickly? You know, for, for this case, right, um, we, we ran a series of pilots. So, we were able to, in, in about two week stints, go from just having one model out there in 320 stores out to all 4,600 stores in, in, in just a few weeks in, in terms of model development. 
and and deployment. And, and that just that simply wouldn't have been possible w- without you know scaling out and and having that having those tools and that that flexibility in, in Dash distributed that allowed us to use that the same code that we that we used on day one. So I, I, I think we're I think we're about to wrap up here, but just just the the main points um, if we can if we can recap here, right? So I, I think these principles for for scaling and doing it quickly will will apply to to almost any enterprise, right? So choose the right tools so that you can you can leverage your your day one code. Um, organize your data logically so so that you can when you scale up, you're matching your data sets to your your physical infrastructure, um, those individual units, and then and then the great thing about Dask is is it allows you to scale out uh, when necessary, to to uh, with only a few lines of code. So, thank you all very much. That that about wraps it up for me. Um, however, I do believe we we are gonna um, take a step out of here, and and head over to uh, a fireside chat and gather. So. Uh, please uh, join me over there. Um, uh, I'll be online for a while to answer any questions that you all have. Appreciate it. Or you can find it on the events page that you were sent uh, prior to the summit. Um, and anyone who's asked the question already have collected that to, to ask in the in the gather town. So.